I'd like to welcome everyone to the medical and public health considerations of COVID-19, a web-based series addressing emerging, emerging topics of importance. Today, we'll, we'll feature a disinfection, uh, disinfectant update as well as a didactic on best practices for preserving PPE and updates from the front lines, Washington, D.C., and Spain. I'd like to thank our webinar series partners for working with ACMT on this webinar series. Just a few reminders, um, this webinar uh, will be recorded and will be posted on the ACMT website. In addition, we have uh, a, a group of uh, uh, resources on our website and questions uh, about this webinar series can be directed to info uh, at acmt.net. At the end of the presentation, we'll uh, feature a Q&A session. I would uh, advise folks to uh, put in their questions either through the uh, chat function or the Q&A function on the WebEx or through the Q&A function on YouTube or Facebook. There are no conflicts of interest. I'd like to thank my uh, co-moderators, uh, Dr. Ziad Kazi, who's a board member ACMT and the president of the Middle East and North African Clinical Toxicology Association and associate professor at Emory University and Diane Colello is also a board member of the American College of Toxicology and the medical executive director of the New Jersey Poison Information and Education System. So we'll begin with a, a brief update regarding uh, disinfectants. There are many chemicals uh, that are used uh, to kill microorganisms. Uh, one way to divide these chemicals is into the classification of disinfectants and antiseptics. Uh, disinfectants are uh, chemicals that are applied to inanimate objects only, <laughs> and, and they're used to kill microorganisms. And as you can see, sodium hypochlorite, which we'll discuss uh, in some detail, uh, is a representative disinfectant. We'll also discuss uh, hydrogen peroxide. Antiseptics are also used to kill uh, microorganisms, but some of it they can be used on living uh, tissue. An example includes soap and water, and some of the alcohol preparations that are used for hand sanitizing. Uh, this is a slide from the uh, EPA of disinfectants for use against SARS CoV 2. Um, while none of these uh, disinfectants per se uh, tested uh, for uh, SARS-CoV-2. They've demonstrated efficacy against harder to kill viruses or demonstrated efficacy against other types of human coronaviruses, uh, such as the, uh, similar to SARS-CoV-2. Highlighted on the screen are uh, four agents of interest, uh, sodium hypochlorite and hydrogen peroxide, which we'll be discussing on the subsequent slides, and ethanol and isopropanol, which are used as uh, alcohol based uh, um, hand washing solutions, and we'll talk about that in a subsequent webinar. Now, sodium hypochlorite is a uh, representative uh, disinfectant. Uh, it's a sodium salt of hypochlorous acid, which is pale greenish yellow, and is commonly known as simply as, as bleach. Um, of interest, as you'll see in a subsequent slide, uh, in some bleach preparations, a small amount of sodium hydroxide, which is a much more potent caustic, is added uh, to the bleach solutions. The concentration of sodium hypochlorite can vary from one bleach solution to the next. Uh, wastewater treatments and, and other commercial uh, tend to use a more concentrated solution, such as 15% or, or even higher. Bacon's solution was uh, officially developed uh, during World War I as a topical antiseptic. So even though uh, sodium hypochlorite is a, is a disinfectant. Um, it's also had some limited use as an antiseptic, but it's a much more dilute uh, preparation. So Dakin's solution uh, typically was 0.4 to 0.5% uh, of sodium hypochlorite, and it was mixed with boric acid as a buffering agent, but with the advent of the antibiotics, uh, the use of Dakin's solution has been on the decline. And nonetheless, there are still some very dilute sodium hypochlorite solutions that, that have been used uh, topically. And one of them is the Vesha wound therapy solution that you can see on this slide. But it's important to point out that the uh, concentration of, of the 
the, the concentration of the uh, sodium hypochlorite is, is very, very low. The typical sodium hypochlorite solution can be seen on this slide. It varies. It's typically from 3% to 8%, and, and this is uh, something that should never be ingested um, because of its um, uh, because of the strength. No sodium hypochlorite solutions should ever be ingested. Uh, as you can see on this label, uh, there's some um, uh, lime scale detergent, which is often is a, a small amount of uh, sodium hydroxide, as it, as it states on the label. And also, as you'll see in a subsequent slide, it may uh, release uh, dangerous gases such as chlorine. So as just described, of course, sodium hypochlorite or bleach is never meant for ingestion or injection, period. <laughs> Its tox uh, toxicity is mainly from its irritant effects, and uh, at higher concentrations can cause significant uh, mucosal injury to the esophagus or to the stomach uh, with subsequent compl complications such as strictures. It also can potentially cause systemic toxicity. These are some photos of a, a caustic agent affecting the eye, uh, and this can lead to either mild irritation or more severe injury, including uh, permanent uh, eye damage and blindness uh, uh, from uh, the top of, from the ocular uh, contamination of, of such a caustic agent. This is a, a bleach ingestion uh, showing some uh, mild uh, mucosal irritation uh, in the uh, gastroesophageal junction on the left and in the stomach uh, right. Uh, this is uh, uh, somewhat of a, a more mild burn injury, but it, with a more concentrated solution, you can have a much more significant burn injury. This slide shows a, a profoundly catastrophic burn injury uh, from a caustic. You can see the mucosal irritation and burn to the lips, and the top left end is, is the stomach, which is charred, and the, the bottom left is, uh, is the esophagus on the, uh, on the autopsy uh, table. So. Uh, clearly, a, a concentrated costing can lead to a, a, a devastating uh, a fatal uh, event, as, as in this case. Uh, finally, uh, bleach can also cause uh, systemic toxicity. Part of uh, intravenous uh, bleach, uh, bleach injection, uh, leading to acute uh, kidney injury. The urine in the middle, which is a color because of the hemoglobinuria, um, and the uh, pathological specimens showing uh, the acute uh, kidney injury on the right. Now, sodium hypochlorite can also react with a variety of substances. It can react with water, it can react with ammonia, it can react with other acids, and this is not infrequent in a, in a household where one may be accidentally mixing chemicals, particularly into a toilet, and, and form a, either chloramine or chlorine or hydrochloric acid. And uh, this just shows the, the common mistake of mixing bleach, or in this case, uh, sodium hypochlorite, with an acid forming chlorine gas. Of course, chlorine gas was the, was the first of the chemical warfare agents that was used during World War I uh, with uh, devastating uh, pulmonary injuries to uh, hundreds of thousands of, of troops, if not millions. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Kazi, uh, who will uh, uh, give a couple of slides about hydrogen peroxide. Thank you, Paul. That's a nice uh, summary of uh, bleach. Um, as you know, we were planning on having a webinar topic just on uh, disinfectants and antiseptics, but recent uh, media attention to this uh, led uh, Paul and I with Diane to, this, to just a brief uh, description today. We will follow up with another one on the uh, alcohol based uh, uh, disinfectants. Um, you know, I think for me, you know, hydrogen peroxide is certainly an important uh, uh, chemical to talk about today. But before I do so, I just want to highlight the days of mixing chemicals together. So, uh, you know, especially in the times of COVID-19, uh, I had a patient that came in with uh, severe shortness of breath and wheezing, requiring, uh, you know, rapid uh, intervention and unable to get a proper history from the patient because of shortness of breath. They were on uh, an exposure to chemical fumes from mixing two chemicals together. So uh, it, sometimes, it, you know, you can't really get that history. So uh, being alert to that is important. Hydrogen peroxide is, to me, is at a different level. It's much, to me, it's much more, more of a potentially dangerous chemical. Uh, as um, as uh, many of us know, it's, a, it's an oxidizing agent. Uh, although it exists in dilute concentrations, uh, typically in the 3% concentration sold for home use, it does also exist in much more concentrated uh, solutions. And it really illustrates really well uh, an important concept and principle of all these chemicals. 
you know, any chemical, as benign as you think it is, can be lethal if used in the right high dose or high concentration. So that, I think, is a unifying principle to remember. Now, uh, hydrogen peroxide, uh, like I said, is uh, varied in concentration. For, com for home use, usually it's used as a mouth gargle. Next slide, please. And then commercially, it may be used for industrial applications, such as um, uh, bleaching, uh, uh, bleaching of wool or in the uh, rubber industry. Uh, and in those situations, you can see severe injuries, uh, even much more than when you, you see in these value solutions. Next slide, please, Paul. And the reason why uh, this is potentially severely uh, uh, injur uh, injuring to your body is because it actually can cause local tissue destruction. But the unique thing about hydrogen peroxide is that the chemical reacts with an enzyme in the tissue called catalase. When it does that, it releases oxygen. And you see here in the patient I had um, a few years ago here in Atlanta, uh, this was a suicidal ingestion of hydrogen peroxide. You see those uh, dark, uh, circles in the liver. These are all air bubbles uh, that came through the portal circulation after the ingestion. So it released uh, the uh, oxygen and that led to this gas formation air embolism that can be uh, very dangerous. And that's uh, one of the unique aspects of hydrogen uh, peroxide toxicity through, in through ingestion, uh, injection, or even irrigation into a wound. We've seen those also where people irrigate uh, wounds with hydrogen peroxide. So please uh, remember this uh, this chemical and how dangerously uh, you know how dangerous it can be. Now um, the treatment for this is also interesting, which is uh, you know uh, involving hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Apart from the typical supportive care and endoscopy to assess the injuries to the uh, gastrointestinal tract, there is the role here for hyperbaric oxygen therapy because of these em air emboli that are produced. So again, uh, important chemical to remember, not for injection, not for ingestion, and certainly high concentrations can be uh, very, very uh, dangerous uh, to, uh, to the public. With that, I just wanna turn it over to my colleague, Diane Calillo, who's gonna talk a little bit about the uh, data from poison standards regarding to these, these type of chemicals. Diane? Thanks very much, Diad. Um, I A few weeks ago, we discussed <clears throat> poison center impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, both for poison centers managing COVID-19 uh, hotlines uh, for information, but also the impact on poison exposures since the beginning of the pandemic. And here is an update of some of that data. So this is from the National Poison Data System, which is the real-time toxical surveillance database that receives information every eight minutes from all 55 poison centers across the U.S. And what you see here are the exposures for both bleach, and that includes um, just unadulterated bleach and the consequences of mixing bleach with other chemicals, as well as on the right, general disinfectant cases, um, which does include some of the bleach cases as well, but is also things like benzalkonium chloride um, and, you know, brand name Lysol wipes and, and all manner of things that people use to disinfect um, surfaces in their home. And you can see on the left where the bleach exposures as well as on the right with disinfectant exposures, when you compare the cases from January to May of 2020 this year to last year, there's a substantial increase in calls to poison centers for exposure to these agents. Now for the bleach exposures, these are primarily um, an increase in inhalation exposures. And again, that's a consequence of mixing bleach with other chemicals as Paul just detailed and the generation of toxic gas byproducts. Whereas on the right, the disinfectant exposures also represent a large increase in dermal, ocular and ingestion exposures. As you can see from the pie charts, fortunately, the medical outcome for these are predominantly minimal, minor, or moderate effect with no fatalities thus far this year. But 
these are certainly preventable exposures and evidence that I think as the frantic efforts of people to keep themselves and their homes free of COVID-19 is certainly being felt um, in increased poison exposures to all of the agents we just described and more. And that's certainly being felt at the poison center level. So with that, I think I'm going to hand it back over to Dr. Kazi so we can continue with the next part of the webinar. Thank you, Diane, for this uh, brief uh, uh, into, you know, summary of this, these important chemicals. Uh, sorry for the uh, technical problems initially. I think we we'll, may have to just uh, delay uh, the end of this webinar till 4.15 p.m., so just uh, giving you a heads up. For those of you who can stay uh, longer, we appreciate it. Now we're going to move to our didactic session of the day uh, when we have today two special speakers um, that are going to share with us important, uh, an important topic regarding PPE preservation. Uh, our first speaker is, is Mr. John Kerner. Uh, I've known John for several years uh, in radiation uh, in mercy preparedness. He's the deputy of the PPE preservation work group of the COVID-19 response at the FEMA ASPR Healthcare Resilience Task Force Strategic Plans Office of the ASPR at HHS. Um, he's also going to uh, be joined in this session with Joselito Ignacio from, um, from the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, Joselito is the science advisor of the Federal Emergency Management Agency Response Directorate, Department of Homeland Security in Washington, D.C. He will focus on the decontamination and reuse of N95 respirators for healthcare facilities. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to John first. And please remember to type in your questions uh, in the uh, chat or Q&A box, and we will take those questions at the end. It is a distinct pleasure to be uh, presenting with this group. Uh, on this important topic. Um, I have a, a, a long-standing relationship with this uh, college and uh, primarily in, in, the, in, in respect to preventing exposures um, and understanding the, the, the toxicology outcomes. Um, in this case, uh, we are going to speak to uh, some of the best practices for PPE preservation. And uh, I'll walk you through uh, a fact sheet that we've uh, jointly developed in response to COVID-19. I think that it's uh, imperative that everyone understands that in your facilities, in your organizations, uh, particularly as the country um, opens up, um, the, the nature of the scarcity of personal protective equipment within the clinical environment and outside of the clinical environment is, is in all likelihood going to change. And that is that the demand signal is going to increase as we start adding back um, uh, uh, surgeries that, that we haven't been performing in the last month or two as we, as we open up other businesses that are uh, essentially competing for um, what is a scarce resource and that is personal protective equipment. Um, so my purpose here today and the purpose of our, our fact sheet and our uh, uh, quasi study it's really to discuss and provide a venue to reflect upon some of the best practices from across uh, the United States and our, our partners internationally for um, reducing the demand signal um, for personal protective equipment in the healthcare environment. And again, this is not just about the, the things that have recently occurred. Um, these are great lessons learned to apply to conservation strategies uh, moving forward. Uh, there are plenty of folks that don't have a high COVID count, but they still are challenged in their acquisition of personal protective equipment to uh, uh, provide barriers uh, for the, the providers and the allied staff. And then certainly, uh, as you've listened to, to Dr. Fauci and many others, we have to anticipate um, many different surge operations uh, coming in the, uh, in, in the follow-on months. So this was uh, something of a quasi-study um, beginning um, in, in mid-March-ish, um, in the end of March, uh, the Federal uh, the, the, uh, Food and Drug Administration uh, released an uh, emergency youth authorization um, to permit the use of alternative um, and international personal protective equipment in the healthcare industry. Um, CDC. Uh, kind of co-committantly uh, released the strategies to optimize the supply of PPE and equipment. 
Um, so uh, our healthcare task force leadership and FEMA leadership realize that there are many other intersects uh, along this uh, supply chain uh, uh, task force, uh, as well as a resource allocation task force um, that uh, if we look strictly at our public health and medical agencies, uh, we, we weren't going to capture the full universe of, of everything um, that is happening. Uh, one, uh, to procure additional supplies. Two, uh, to preserve existing supplies. Three, uh, to enhance uh, uh, manufacturing in the industry. Um, so uh, we were tasked with uh, putting together a, for lack of a better term, a national strategy uh, to communicate to users, providers, decision makers, and implementers um, just what uh, PPE preservation means. And there is some confusion there, and I hope to clear that up. Now, uh, we, we did do something of a, of a, of a best uh, practices study um, as part of our development of the fact sheet, and that includes uh, literature reviews. We've got ad hoc technical working groups set up. Um, we did a lot of uh, experiential and knowledge gaining um, evidence gathering uh, within the practitioner community, and that is you know, direct reaches to those in New York, New Jersey, San Francisco, Atlanta, Seattle, and, and, and elsewhere um, to, to gather the information on what their needs were, uh, their level of scarcity, as well as what they were doing to try to overcome some of these while still uh, providing a safe, uh, as, as safe an environment uh, for practitioners as possible. Um, we've uh, run the, the fact sheet through focus groups to, un to understand usability and uh, acquisition of uh, the information therein, um, and it went through an extensive review before publishing. So when we're talking about person protective equipment, I don't think I need to remind this group of what we're talking about. We're talking about not just the respiratory protection and the N95s that everybody is uh, so happy to chat about on the news. Uh, we're talking about the full spectrum from gloves to gowns to respirators and masks, eyewear and face shields. Um, now, importantly, in the duration of a, a COVID hospitalization, on average, what we're finding, um, and, I, and I don't have the reference or source for this, this value, but I, I, I could dig it up. Uh, we're finding about 350, 400, uh, pieces of uh, uh, the individual categories uh, outside of GLOVE that are used over the course of a, of a COVID hospitalization. So the demand signal is, is quite large um, for the spectrum of personal protective equipment. Um, importantly, uh, what I'm about to talk about is not uh, to convey information about what the, the standard practices are on a really great day when we have a full amount of material available. Uh, we all know what it is to operate in the hospital when you have the things that you need and, and, and you don't have the, the extraordinary pressures of, of multiple, multiple patients with, with, with the similar conditions. Um, so we're not talking about conventional strategies. We're really talking about when we shift to contingency strategies and uh, hopefully in an effort to avert, avert a crisis uh, situation. Now, this um, graphic is kind of based on the National Academies of Science, the, the crisis standards of care construct. Um, that you may have also seen in some of our nuclear work. Um, and um, what, what, it, it, what it conveys is that when we're, when we're in that, that orange-yellow contingency phase, which most of the world is right now, um, we can still provide the functionally equivalent care, or in our case, functionally equivalent protection. Um, but we need to start adapting now in order to conserve existing supplies. Uh, we never let our children eat all of the cookies at one time. Uh, we ask them to take one at a time so they last a while. And, and I think that that's a, a similar principle here. And the whole idea is that um, we can expect if we have utilization at the normal paces with the additional surge requirements um, that we will reach crisis. And in that case, um, that's where we shift into situations where we're, we're doing things that may um, be questionable in, in terms of the standards, um, but more importantly, um, that are certainly not within um, the standard practice. Uh, there's uh, ways that we can approach crisis that are more rational and science-based, and, and that's what we try to do. Um, and basically, that gets to the point where uh, I'll use N95s. When you don't have any N95s left or you have very few left, 
uh, we have to come up with ways to, to truly extend um, the availability of that, those devices. Um, so here's an image of the, of the fact sheet um, that we developed, and you see the link at the bottom. And, and yes, I, I did see the comment. Um, you will be availed of the uh, uh, presentation here. Uh, importantly, uh, all of that information we congealed down into a uh, three pillars of practice for the preservation of uh, personal protective equipment under contingency or crisis standards. And that is one, to reduce, uh, two, to reuse, and three, to repurpose. So uh, we use the three R's uh, as, our, um, as our mantra, uh, reduce, reuse, and repurpose. Now, um, the fact sheet was published in, uh, in mid-April um, and uh, basically amplifies those CDC strategies and knits them together with some of the FDA work and some of the other work that FEMA is doing um, and, and suggests those appropriate uh, uh, actions for organizations and facilities to consider um, to, to, to mitigate uh, their, their, their PPE uh, utilization uh, rates. And uh, I think it's important that uh, these are not necessarily guidance, um, but they are a reflection of what people are actually doing um, that are providing a safe environment for, for healthcare practitioners and allied health. Um, when I say U U.S. healthcare facilities should be begin using uh, contingency strategies now, um, that applies in, on March 12th as, as much as it does uh, on April 12th or, or May 6th. Um, and again, the, the reduce, reuse, repurpose. So all of this is based on um, some, some underlying tenets for uh, pandemic um, preparedness and operations. And uh, one is that when we know there's going to be a big surge, we want to conserve uh, medical PPE across the spectrum of the critical industri industries um, that are open and operating, conserve those specific pieces of medical PPE for medical care. Uh, there are critical environments in the, in the ICU and, 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 the, and the OR um, where nothing can be substituted, and, and we really need to um, keep that in mind that those things need to be focused on. Um, again, the underlying principle of social distancing, and then some real practical guidance that we've, we've ascertained from our, our triage sites, from our testing sites, from our, our EMS community, and, the, and, our, and our law enforcement community, and that is the if you don't have to get into a small space with another individual, whether they're a patient or, 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 or somebody you're interviewing for other purposes, don't do it. Try to do it outside or in large open spaces. So quickly, uh, <clears throat> a reduce is all about reducing the rate of uh, use of PPE. And uh, to, to keep things uh, uh, straightforward and, and focused, uh, when we think about using uh, some engineering controls and barriers and technology. I think that anybody that has been to uh, a, a store in the last month or so, you see the um, the, the acrylic or the, the plastic uh, uh, partitions that are put up. Those barrier controls are, are intended to to eliminate splatter and, and droplet transmission. Um, the triage centers uh, or the uh, testing centers are doing their interviews through partially closed windows. Um, yes, we can do um, improved ventilation in, in a variety of ways, the ventilated headboards and such. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, things like source control where we're, we're, we're masking patients one way or the other um, that are either uh, PUIs or, or confirmed uh, COVID. Um, the image you see at the bottom really is, is demonstrative of, uh, of what reducing the usage rate of PPE is, and that is, um, you know, using technology, uh, teleconsultation, telemedicine, uh, remote observation. Um, we've even got uh, uh, court cases happening via uh, uh, court appearances happening um, via a video, um, which is not a new technology, but that's that's been enhanced um, to apply to more folks. And then simple interventions. Uh, my brother-in-law is a physician up in New Jersey and described to me how the first day that he um, returned to work for uh, to see COVID patients that when he walked onto the ward, um, it was interesting to him that, to see the um, fusion pumps and, and the, 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 um, the monitors uh, in the hallway outside of the patient rooms um, so that uh, he could monitor vitals and, 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 and um, take care of the patient, at, at least uh, the normal checks, um, without entering the room, without having to do a PPE change. 
And uh, some other examples about reducing the rate of usage include cohorting patients. Uh, I think you've all heard of the alternate care uh, sites that are being set up all over the country. Um, in some cases, they're being set up as the um, uh, standard care for low, low acuity patients, um, which is basically cohorting the non-COVID uh, cases away from areas where we may have high concentration of critical patients with COVID. And then the, the, the flip side of that is either uh, patients that are, are recovering um, from COVID-19, um, having them, uh, if they need to be in, a, in, a, in, a, in an attended uh, capacity for another week or two, having them um, be with others that are recovering from infection, um, and that's the quote-unquote COVID uh, hospitals. Uh, the federal government uh, and the HHS, uh, Department of Defense, uh, we've set up uh, a number of these across the country, and uh, we intend to keep some of them warm uh, in case there are hot spots and, and things occur uh, later in the year. Um, so I talked about cohorting patients, minimizing contact, um, consolidating, consolidating activities to a single visit. Uh, many of these things um, seeming uh, intuitive, uh, but what they really are doing is, you remember that 375 uh, number, uh, what they're really doing is drawing down the amount of PPE use uh, from standard care uh, to something that uh, is, is much less, uh, simply by do, you know, reducing that usage rate and, and the demand signal. And then um, some other things are, are just to, to really understand what some of your requirements and burn rates are. Um, most folks don't understand how much uh, person protective equipment a facility will use. Um, and, and I'm sure you're all familiar with, with a number of uh, different facilities that are extending use times as long as the PPE is not damaged. And then reuse. Um, reuse starts to get us into some of our um, crisis uh, uh, standard uh, conditions wherein uh, we don't have uh, enough uh, personal protective equipment, or maybe we only have three days uh, of personal protective equipment available. Um, and that's where we um, start to implement other strategies to optimize the supply um, of PPE and equipment. Um, some of them are, um, the, in this image, you see the, uh, the folks wearing the powered air purifying respiratory protection. Um, that, that's actually a repurposing, um, although in this case, those are healthcare PAPRs, so they're, they're reusable and they're cleanable. And um, so rather than changing N95s each time they do a nasal swab, um, they're, um, they're, they're, they're using the PAPRs. And it's also more comfortable for the providers. Um, you'll also see that they're, they're using um, coveralls instead of hospital gowns, or, or um, uh, uh, yeah, instead of hospital gowns. Uh, I think importantly, um, when we're looking at reuse strategies, uh, we've, we've got a number of facilities now that are actually issuing a limited number of uh, N95s in particular, and, uh, and asking folks to um, either maintain that piece of respiratory protection as, as well as they can um, for a, a few days to a week. Um, and, uh, and the other piece of that is, uh, which, which um, Captain Ignacio will speak to in a moment, is uh, looking at uh, uh, some of the implementation guidance for decontamination and reuse of filtering face piece respirators, which is a, a really interesting topic. Um, and then last in our, our repurpose uh, category uh, where we're, we're uh, using other than the NIOSH approved, other NIOSH approved respirators instead of N95s uh, when protection is required. And that, that you, know, you saw the, uh, um, the image with the powered air purified respirator, um, seeking alternative supplies of, of, of personal protective equipment. Um, in this case, uh, it looks like that individual that's uh, uh, doing the testing uh, with the window up, which is a reduced strategy, um, has um, uh, looks like uh, commercial uh, rubber gloves on and, and Tyvek coveralls that you normally wouldn't um, procure through your standard medical supply companies. Um, and in that case, it's entirely appropriate and entirely protective uh, so that we can um, reserve the, 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 the medical PPE um, for the providers um, in, in, uh, in, in critical need for certain procedures and such. Um, using um, filtering face pieces beyond their expiration dates, there has been an emergency use authorization um, for that to extend the use, and there's some inspection criteria there. 
And then we've also authorized, I'm sure you've seen um, some of the foreign respiratory protection in your facilities at this point. So I think that in closing, the, 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 one of the really critical pieces of this entire endeavor is to reach out to the population in your facility, and whether it's allied health, uh, whether it's food service, custodial, uh, uh, clinicians, surgeons, everyone in between, um, to include your behavioral health folks, and make sure that everybody understands a number of different things. And it begins with why are we doing this? I, mean, I hear a lot of practitioners coming back and saying, well, why don't we just get more PPE? Um, and and the, the reality is we're not going to buy our way out of this. There, you know, you, you, there's only so much fruit that grows on a tree. And um, we have manufacturing across the world maximized right now. And um, everyone has a demand signal that it's trying to feed. There's just no more. So we need to think about rational and safe ways to protect our providers and our, and our folks and make sure that they understand why and that they can buy in and maybe even offer other suggestions for best practices that could really improve um, the work environment. Um, the proper training, uh, taking the time to actually go through each piece or each change with that staff and with that personnel is critical. Uh, simply doing a flyby with a piece of equipment that someone is unfamiliar with is probably dangerous and certainly um, puts that, uh, that provider or that, that staffer um, in a position where they're not comfortable with, what, with what's going on. Um, at the bottom of the slide, you'll see some of the references that I alluded to in terms of the CDC guidance, um, the prior uh, Coca-Cola uh, on PPE that was conducted, and then um, there's much more. But when you go to um, the fact sheet itself, you'll see a number of links in there, and the whole uh, purpose of that fact sheet is to describe the strategy um, and to kind of tie in all these, these, these various and sundry resources. Um, so with that, I will uh, hand over to my colleague, Cap Ignacio, and uh, he will cover down on one of the reuse uh, components of the strategy. Great. Thanks, John, and thank you, Paul and Adrian, Dr. Kazi, for the opportunity to speak to everyone here this afternoon. So I am Cap Ignacio. I am the CBRN Science Advisor uh, with the U.S. Public Health Service uh, assigned to FEMA. So, so when we talk about decontamination and reuse of, of N95 filtering face pieces, uh, it is an example, one example or practice under reuse. Uh, in a critical shortage, as recommended by the CDC as well as FDA, um, reuse of N95 respirators may be an option that healthcare facilities and first responders could consider. But what's the data? And, and I'm simply going to share the data that the CDC has had recently published with regards to uh, the efficacy of, 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 the, of the current practice. So, so vaporous hydrogen peroxide or VHP uh, seemed to rise to the top as a, as a method of decontamination of, of these respirators, um, showing uh, up to 20 treatments, uh, uh, not impacting significantly the filtration performance or the fit of the N95 respirator, as well as showing greater than 99.99% antimicrobial efficacy. Um, the second one, and, and we'll talk about BHP a lot uh, because currently the FDA's emergency use authorization for some of the systems that are in place currently are based on this BHP method. The other, the other that seem that seem to have uh, uh, been uh, peer-reviewed uh, research-wise is, is moist heat. That has also shown to have uh, a, a high efficacy as well as uh, very little impact on the filtration performance and, and the fit, um, except for the fact that there have been some uh, respirators that showed seal compromise uh, after moist heat was subjected to those devices, but not certainly not all. 
Then the other is uh, ultraviolet germicidal. Uh, this has shown a little bit, uh, uh, particularly when you're talking about 0.5 to 950 joules per square centimeter, has been shown to uh, to, to impact uh, the the uh, microbial uh, presence uh, on the respirators. Um, the, the, the problem with, with what they found, though, in the research is that U, UV has been shown to reduce significantly the material durability uh, at higher doses. Uh, since you're essentially, uh, you know, using heat uh, directly onto, onto, or you're trying to create heat in a sense uh, onto the uh, respirator. So that's not completely surprising that you would see that. Um, so the, so you've seen or heard of the Battelle uh, uh, research on, uh, on vaporous hydrogen peroxide. Uh, they've done some, some studies involving a 10-minute um, conditioning phase, 20-minute gassing phase. Um, the, the microbe that was tested was uh, geobacillus sterile thermophilus spores, as well as certain uh, bacteriophages, and that was what was shown to have uh, a pretty high uh, antimicrobial efficacy. Um, uh, there have been some room biodecontamination uh, methods. Uh, you've heard of the BioQuil, that's used quite often. Um, uh, in healthcare facilities to decontaminate either rooms or medical equipment in those rooms. Um, and then the, the Kenny personal communication on the value quill, uh, also reinforcing the uh, effective use of that system. And then under, under the UV uh, germicidal irradiation, uh, this has been tested on influenza, H5N1, avian influenza, and some of the uh, influenza A uh, strains, uh, Anhu and Shanghai strains, as well as against MERS-CoV and SARS-CoV. Um, and again, based upon the, the peer review literature has shown to, to be effective at 99.9%, .9%, but again, as a reminder, uh, some of the respirators did show material degradation. Um, there's this uh, uh, discussion that you probably heard about using microwave generated steam and microwave steam bags, uh, very similar to, I think, some of the uh, food uh, kinds of uh, pre uh, preparation devices that, uh, that, are that use microwave. Um, the, Department of Homeland Security Science and Technology is actually looking at microwave generated steam. Uh, we're hoping to get some results over the next few weeks um, to see how efficacious that is. Um, obviously, uh, in a healthcare setting, that would have to pass uh, FDA EUA uh, for that to be used in that setting. Um, And then uh, that kind of goes up with moist heat incubation. Uh, what we've not yet evaluated or seen any studies yet is uh, the liquid hydrogen peroxide. Uh, now the ethylene oxide, there is a company that is, has submitted some data, I, I can't recall the, the manufacturer, uh, on the use of ethylene oxide uh, for, for this particular response for SARS-CoV-2. Um, I've not seen the data. I've not uh, talked with anyone from FDA. All I know uh, in terms of the emergency use authorizations, all the ones that we've seen so far is based off the vaporous hydrogen peroxide method. So talking about the FDA EOA, so these are the systems that are currently to date have, have an FDA EOA. So so you have the four sterile hospital sterilizers, the Sterilucent, the Steris V Pro, the ASP Sterad, and the Sterizone. Uh, the ASP Sterad, by the way, there, there's uh, a couple other models not shown here that that have that are covered as being okay uh, to to do N95 decontamination. 
And then on the bottom is the Battelle Critical Care Decontamination System, or CCDS. All of these involve vaporous hydrogen peroxide method. The, the hospital sterilizers uh, are also cleared for existing medical equipment, uh, most commonly endoscopes. Um, and now they're just permitted to use, um, uh, use them for N95. Well, what's the big difference between these hospital sterilizers and the Battelle critical care decon system? Um, the big difference is volume, as you can imagine. The Battelle critical care decon system actually disconnects on the bottom. There's four of these that actually serve as a decontamination unit. So in a, in a decon cycle of approximately eight to nine hours, you can decontaminate up to up to 40,000 uh, uh, 40, N95 filtering face piece respirators. So that's tremendous. And the other, the other thing under the current EUA is that the CCDS can, is allowed to decontaminate the same respirator, the same N95 respirator, up to 20 times. Uh, the, the Sterizone, ASP, Steris, and Sterilucent, they vary, but it's certainly not up to 20. Um, one model, um, I believe it's the ASP, um, and decontaminate up to 10 times an N95. The others uh, varies between two or five times. So, and there are very, and there are uh, other stipulations with regards to the numbers that can enter into, into those uh, units. As you can imagine, the size is small. Um, so, Early on, the Department of Health and Human Services, in coordination with FEMA, decided that because of the uh, forecast for significant N95 shortages as a result of the su huge supply demand, was to go ahead and, and procure and use the Patel staff to, to deploy these critical care decontamination systems to a variety of different locations in the United States whichever states or territories or tribal nations requested it from FEMA. So, but they are funded through Health and Human Services through a Defense Logistics Agency contract. Um, and the Battelle CCDS are positioned in, in whatever locations that states or territories have requested. And uh, Battelle recently hired a consulting firm to do a lot of outreach with the surrounding healthcare communities, first responder agencies, dental offices, any, any entity defined as a healthcare per, per personnel in the emergency use authorization, uh, which is pretty wide, as long as you can show that you are operating in a healthcare setting. Um, the process for using this system, first of all, it's free of charge. It's fully funded by, by Health and Human Services. So there's no fee to the users. There's no fee to the healthcare facility. There's no fee to the states or local jurisdictions or the territories. Um, though where they are located, a healthcare facility or, or first responder organization simply goes onto the Patel website, establishes an account, Battelle will respond back and, and indicate the nearest Battelle site or system that could service that particular organization. There are instructions that Battelle issues to those users, uh, one of them being a site location code so that Battelle knows who it belongs to. Um, some healthcare facilities have even gone so far as to write the person's name down on the respirator so that it can return back to that user. That seems to be a, a best practice that a lot of healthcare facility folks uh, really like and have increased acceptability knowing that they're, bringing, they're, they're using the same respirator that they left with and decontaminated. And then the health, and those agencies collect them in a biohazard bag, properly package it in accordance with the instructions. They send it off to the Battelle a system site, and it's like a dry cleaning service. They decontaminate them, and after about a 24-hour, 48-hour turnaround time, it, um, the, the, the N95s come back uh, and, and are available for reuse. 
So the big conclusion when it comes to N95 decontamination is that it is an example of preservation of PPE, helps to extend that life of the available N95 respirators that are out there, which we know, as John said, it's not, it's not easy. It's, uh, I, I think there are probably some healthcare facilities are not seeing the shortages as much because they've been uh, well, well supplied, but there are many, many places and first responder organizations that have not seen that same uh, supply chain uh, maintained. So, so it is definitely, uh, this is a time of crisis uh, in, our, in our opinion. Um, it is a good reminder, as John alluded to, to use a hierarchy of controls of elimination, substitution, energy, and control, safe work practices, and then PPE as the last resort, if at all possible. Um, and then I just want to emphasize that in this time of crisis of shortages, particularly of N95, and you know, there are, these are authorized capabilities that I presented to you, the, the vaporous hydrogen peroxide, those those four hospital sterilizers, the, the critical care decon systems for safe reuse, decontamination and safe reuse of N95 respirators. So. Captain Ignacio, thank you so much. And uh, Mr. Mr. Kerner, this is a really uh, very appreciated, very informative. Uh, coming from the front line myself in the ER and uh, realizing the importance of my PPE, I thank you for all your effort and energy in working and researching these topics and uh, also the task force that you belong to and how you all uh, provided the fact sheet and, and all of these technologies for us. And well, I appreciate that. And I believe everyone uh, feels the same way. Thank you again. If you can mm -hmm. uh, some questions, uh, that'd be great because we do have several questions that came through, but we still have a couple of updates uh, from uh, Spain and from DC. So if it's okay, we are going to ask people to stick around till 4.15 till 4.30 p.m. actually. Yep, yep, I'll, I'll at least be around. Uh, yeah, that's fine with me. Okay, thank you so much, I appreciate it, because we, we do have a lot of questions. So uh, moving to our next phase of our webinar, our updates on the front line, an ever popular uh, part of this, uh, of this series. We start with Dr. Shika Kapil. Dr. Kapil is currently an assistant professor of emergency medicine at Georgetown University School of Medicine. She's a proud uh, alumni of Emory University, where I am, and uh, completed her emergency medicine residency there before completing a critical care medicine fellowship at Stanford, California. She's an attending physician uh, in the surgical and cardiovascular ICU at MedStar Washington Hospital Center. And she is going to give us an update about the use of uh, VV ECMO for COVID-19. Shika? Thank you, Dr. Kazi, and thanks um, to all the presenters before me. I just learned a lot. Um, I'll be talking about how we are using ECMO to support our COVID patients here in DC. Um, here is just a, I'll start with a brief overview of how the VV circuit works. Um, this is a little diagram that I'll talk through. In severe ARDS, the lungs become very stiff and non-compliant, and the alveoli fill with fluid and are then unable to participate in normal gas exchange. So the ECMO circuit allows us to oxygenate blood independently of the lungs. Um, so blood is drained from the patient from a large uh, multi-stage drainage cannula in the IVC. It flows into the pump that you see there into the membrane oxygenator, and this is where the gas exchange occurs. So blood is oxygenated, CO2 is removed, and then it returns to the patient through the, what we call the return cannula. Um, directly into the heart, uh, dumps into the RA, pumps through the heart and lungs as blood normally does, and out into the body. Um, there are, you know, many variations of a VV configuration, but this is sort of the most classic standard uh, configuration. When we have patients on the circuit, we can set the ventilator settings at extremely protective um, volumes to allow them to heal. So there have been two major randomized control trials on the utility of VV ECMO Caesar in 2009 and Aeolia in 2018. Um, despite some of the sort of controversies surrounding the results of the Aeolia trial, generally we feel that VV ECMO in selected patients confers a mortality benefit over traditional ventilator management alone. 
this next slide is this these are the numbers as of Monday. So this is from ELSO, it's the International ECMO Society. So worldwide, you can see we have about 700 COVID patients on ECMO, and so far a 46% survival rate. So in my mind, we have to sort of weigh three major arms to best apply advanced therapies like ECMO in the setting of a pandemic. Um, the first being uh, patient selection. I think it's the next slide, okay. Um, the first arm of this being uh, patient selection. So in this table, um, we and most other ECMO centers are generally selecting patients, but, uh, and I'll explain the traffic light colors in a minute. Um, you can see we consider patients with severe ARDS um, defined by PaO2 of generally less than 100. So that's the um, PaO2 to FiO2 ratio, less than 100. Uh, but specifically, we're considering people who are less than 80 for six hours or less than 50 for three hours. So these are very severely ill patients. Um, and we make sure that they have had an opportunity uh, for maximal um, optimization of their traditional ventilation. So that means they've had a trial of cloning, they've had a trial of paralysis, and they uh, we are persistently unable to oxygenate them. Uh, perhaps the more re relevant uh, is the group of patients we exclude. So this includes patients whose age is over 70, patients who have been ventilated for more than seven days. We are not offering eCPR in these patients. Um, and I think most centers are not offering eCPR in these patients. Uh, we're trying to limit uh, our patients to patients with single organ system failure. Um, and these inclusion and exclusion criteria are fairly standard across the board. They're derived from the trials that I mentioned earlier. So the colors on the table correspond with um, sort of the second arm of what we need to consider, which is resource allocation. So does the hospital have the bandwidth to support this very resource intensive therapy? So these ECMO patients will require a one-to-one -one bedside nursing. They require a perfusionist to run the circuit usually. They need many blood transfusions. Um, to the point about preserving PPE, how many times so many people have to go in and out of the room? Do we have the resources to support this? Um, so we will stepwise narrow the number, the sort of the inclusion criteria and the number of patients we'll accept um, based on the available resources. So when we're only at 50% capacity as determined by hospital leadership, we are um, sort of full steam ahead. When we are at 50 to 75 percent capacity, we will limit our uh, exclude. We will make our exclusion criteria more tight, such that we'll only accept patients who are under 60. And then, when we are greater than 75 capacity, we will not offer ECMO um, because we need to allocate those resources differently. So this sort of leads into the final arm. So the first two being patient selection, resource allocation. The final arm is ethics. So similar to what some places in New York City are seeing rationing ventilators, et cetera, we will hopefully not, but we could come to the point where we have to ration ECMO circuits. So, um, you know, in the red zone where we have not reached yet, we, we won't be able to offer ECMO and we'll find ourselves in a situation where we may have to take people off who have been on the circuit for quite some time in order to offer it to a candidate who may be more of a benefit. So we've engaged our palliative team and our uh, hospital ethics team to help us come up with um, a solution should we reach that point. So I can share our personal experience. Um, I'm actually currently on service in our ECMO unit right now, and I'm tracking the data for our group. Um, so in DC, this is from the um, Hopkins um, corona number tracker website. We have about 5,000 cases confirmed in the DC metro area right now. Um, we currently at our hospital, out at, we have about 1,000 bed capacity. We have nearly 200 COVID patients um, and we have about 120 ICU beds. Uh, our ICUs are full, but they are not 100% COVID. We have about probably half of our ICU beds are full of COVID patients right now. Uh, we have the capacity to run nine ECMO circuits at one time. 
Um, so far, we've cannulated, actually, we've cannulated 15. Uh, we put one patient on last night. Um, five to six now remain on ECMO. Two have been discharged home. Uh, three have passed away, and four are, have been decannulated, meaning they've come off the ECMO circuit, but remain on the ventilator. Uh, we're finding so far, just from the data analysis that we have of these BV ECMO COVID patients, the average runtime on the circuit is about 12 days. Um, so, next slide. so this is just my personal experience. I just want to emphasize that this is the case series and our experience from a single institution. So it's, I'm calling it insight, not evidence yet. Uh, we're hoping, you know, we'll publish what we have and, um, you know, just take it with a grain of salt. We're all learning a tremendous amount every day. Um, and one thing is for certain, this virus is not behaving like typical ARDS or really anything that we've seen before. Um, we are seeing quite a bit of coagulopathy. So this has been reported in, um, so widely reported in multiple organ systems. So patients are presenting with, young patients are presenting with stroke. Um, we're seeing on the ECMO circuit, um, these patients are having a higher incidence of heparin resistance. Their anti drum 3 levels are low. We are using our gastrovan much more frequently than we would be. Um, we are seeing deranged tags, thromboelastogram. Um, and we, this is, this is something that we are attributing to the virus. And we just don't have a good idea of what the mechanism um, is of their prothrombotic state. Um, the next thing that we're seeing is their relative lack of shock after their initial resuscitation period. So, of course, during the peri-intubation period, they're profoundly hypoxic. They'll oftentimes need fairly high doses of pressors just to get them through. And then once they're settled out on the circuit, they really require almost no vasopressor. They have an, an isolated oxygen deficit. So that's all we're giving them is just very concentrated oxygen. So this is also sort of interesting and atypical of um, patients who are classic ARDS patients, which, you know, usually spiral into multi-organ system failure. Um, we are now starting to see superimposed bacterial infections. Um, we're seeing pseudomonal, Klebsiella, ventilator associated pneumonias, we are seeing gram positive bacteremia, probably from uh, maybe some element of nosocomial infection, but probably from their big line. Um, but we they don't usually um, they don't usually pop up until week two or three or so. Um, so our N is small at this time. So this is anecdotal, but it seems that young and single organ system failure patients are doing better overall. Um, so right now in my service, every patient I have on ECMO is under the age of 50, um, and I have a few as young as 30. Um, we are trying to limit the patients that we put on who require CRT support, dialysis support. Um, we are using some of the adjunct therapies that are still being investigated. We're enrolling our patients in some trial, the TOSI trial. We um, just got permission for emergency use of remdesivir. Uh, we are using convalescent plasma. Um, I, you know, to be honest, I'm not seeing any immediate benefit from any of these therapies from the bedside perspective. I, I hope that we see a bigger effect on a large scale. Um, but right now, we are just doing the best we can with the tools we have. Um, we've, we, you know, we learned a lot about resource allocation from the H1N1 outbreak in 2009. There's a lot of really nice papers from the Italians on how they redistributed patients to um, different hospitals so that everyone could get the care that they needed. So, so we've been um, sort of redistributing patients throughout our hospital system. Once they get decannulated, they uh, will, and remain intubated, they'll go to a different ICU that has the capacity to take them. So we're able to serve as many people as we can. Um, but we are uh, learning a lot along the way. Thank you, Dr. Kapil. This, uh, this was really um, uh, appreciated. I know you're working today and you're very busy. We appreciate you taking the time. 
and sharing this, uh, uh, you know, really clinical bedside uh, experience with the, with the, with the VV ECMO for severe COVID-19. Uh, I know you have several questions coming in. I know that you're going to have to go, uh, and we can send those questions to you, and we can uh, respond to the to the to our participants by email. Thank you, Dr. Gapil. Our next uh, uh, update from the front line is from Malaga, Spain. We have Dr. Francisco Moya. Dr. Moya is a board member of the Spanish Society of Emergency Medicine and a member of the Research Committee of the European Society of Emergency Medicine. He's an emergency medicine specialist as well as a sports medicine specialist. But because of his role in uh, hospital administration, became really involved recently with the, with the COVID-19 outbreak in the uh, hospital management of the surge. And he's going to give us a brief update about his experience doing that in Malaga, Spain. Dr. Francisco Moya. Hello, everybody. Thanks, Siad, uh, for the introduction. Uh, let me thank uh, Lisa Moreno, president-elect of the American Academy of Emergency Medicine, who put me in touch in LA with you guys. Uh, thank you, you all, uh, to, for giving me this opportunity to give you a little update in LA what the, the current situation is in our country. I mean, I know that I have very little time. Is we are now, you know, like past an hour. And I'm trying to focus because I can I can be talking you know like for hours you know about about you know like this this pandemia and and the and the, the causes and, and whatever. So there's a little picture of our our of our hospital which is placed you know like very close to Malaga Airport, southern Spain. It's a private hospital and that's you know like one of the things you know like that is peculiar of our country that we have a very strong public health system free for everybody. And we also have in a very strong private health system. And just to give you, just let me start, you know, like, uh, only paying a little tribute, you know, like, to all, all the COVID-19 patients, the ones that passed away and, and the ones, you know, that we have to manage. Um, it's been a horrible experience, experience you know, like, probably something that we, most of, most of us, you know, like, never, never lived before. As professionals, and I, 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 be, I said in you know, in previous webinars and meetings that I participated that in 25 years of career in hospital medicine and working in different countries, I never seen anything like it. Um, just let me pass into into what is the current situation in Spain, and probably you know let's listen to you know everybody can learn you know from us. I mean we 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 can be proud you know like of of several things about you know like how we. How we manage and we uh, and how we we finally are seeing the light, you know, like, uh, about you know like the experience of of managing you know this kind of this kind of situation. But um, I mean, I think the first slide is not to be very proud about it because we are probably you know like in terms of 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 deaths, you know, like per million people, we are second second worst worldwide, only behind Belgium. Um, this is, you know, like, uh, considering, you know, like all the PCR positive um, uh, tests, because the Belgians are considering COVID-19 patients for the suspected cases, and they are counting on, as, 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 as numbers, not like us. So probably, you know, like we are the first one in having, you know, the highest number of deaths, you know, like per million, uh, with more than 500. We are also, you know, the first in having, you know, the most infective, you know, the healthcare workers. Um, now, today, you know, we reach the the number of 45,000 um, 45, healthcare workers infected, you know, by COVID-19, confirmed with PCR. From all those 45,000, uh, 15% or about 15%, between 15 and 16%, have to be hospitalized. Um, that means, you know, there is about, you know, like more than 7,000 of colleagues, you know, like have to be hospitalized. And sadly, you know, like are, are around, you know, like 50. We have 50 deaths between all the healthcare workers, which is, you know, like in the, if you consider, you know, like in the, that we've been facing this situation for the last two, three months, I can't, you know, like translate this into a probably uh, kind of military intervention or whatever. And you can imagine, you know, like any country having to sustain, you know, like 7,200 casualties um, in a mission, for example, and um, um, 45, 50 deaths. So it's quite dramatic. We had an issue, and, and I think the first part of the webinar is being about uh, protective equipment, um, um, personal protective equipment, and how you know, to be more effective, 
Um, we have in order to guys in order from from your government that did fantastic presentations, but for whatever reason, you know, I don't think we were prepared. Um, we we knew the situation in China, but I mean, when when the situation was hitting Italy, um, and I mean, we are practically brothers, you know, with them, um, and the numbers and how the dramatic situation was there, I still, you know, I don't know how. Uh, we were not prepared, you know, for this. Um, we have, you know, a massive, you know, a lack of, of strategic equipment supply. Um, and I mean, luckily for us, in our in our organization, you know, we never had any problems. But you know, this is because you know, we're a strong private healthcare group in Spain, the second one, the second largest. We got our procurement central office, and I think you know, everybody, you know, we'll talk a bit later about our experience, you know, we all. You know, they work very hard together. You know, not to have lack of equipment for our for our people, but it's been a big issue. Still, is a big issue. Um, and hopefully, you know, they will now that they, that we manage, you know, with a lot of effort to flatten our curve, you know, that we are more effective in in the equipment supply and, and to protect ourselves. Um, there wasn't any availability of massive PCR testing from from the beginning on when when you know we started you know, having our our first cases um that's been uh, and that has continued i mean there's still you know like now we are in in this escalation phase zero after having as as the slide says you know in the last sentence you know we had one of the world hardest lockdowns and that was the measure that has to be taken and i that's one thing that i can i can be proud as as a spaniard you know i having uh, people like us, uh, we are, I mean, we are famous, you know, for, for partying and being very family orientated and whatever, you know, like, in amaze, you know, like how the normal people have respond, you know, like to, to this situation. And they, they really, 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 um, surprisingly for me, they kept, you know, like the, they kept, you know, the lockdown uh, very well. And, and probably that's one of the factors, you know, like why we overcame, you know, like I think quite rapidly, you know, like the dramatic situation. But still, you know, we are doing a escalation without knowing exactly you know, how many people are all around there, you know, it's symptomatic and replicating the virus and whatever. Now we are doing antibody rapid tests and whatever, but at the peak of the, or when the, the epidemic or the, the pandemic, the pandemic, you know, was hitting us, there was not a massive testing policy from our government. The, I think you know like Germany did. They even you know they like started preparing you know, themselves in you know, a like kind of you know like manufacturing their own their own capacity to to test to test you know like with local manufacturing companies, um, and that's the reason why they have you know like less, less per million than us. And and other countries you know like similar to us like Greece and Portugal, they did confinement and they did other measures you know like to to try to stop this. But this is the situation that the, and the uh, obviously these, these dramatic figures, you know, uh, has have happened, but currently, you know, we are uh, flattening the curve. Um, we are kind of, you know, like, uh, we have three days, you know, like less than 200 deaths uh, daily. And I mean, today, you know, there was a little peak of 200 and something. Um, the number of cases are going down, and just to put you into perspective, in a province like like ours, like Malaga, with nearly one million people, there were only two new ICU cases yesterday. So, I mean, and for the last ten days in our hospital, we didn't have a case. Um, I have to say that yesterday, our hospital was a COVID-free hospital, and obviously, you know, we we. We put in LA all the safe hospital policy to try to attend yeah, the other emergencies that we don't know, you know, that was was coming to us in LA after this because I mean, uh, surprisingly, we had very little in LA acute coronary syndrome, very little strokes in LA during this period. So um, I don't know. I mean, that's probably one of the consequences you know, of this pandemic as well. Um, just to pass to the next slide, and it will be the last one. Uh, just to comment. Dr. Moya, can you speak up a little bit, please? I think your voice was fading. Yeah. Low. Yeah, can you can you hear me better now? Yeah, I think so. If you can speak yeah. up. And... Yeah, just the next slide, please. Um, in the next slide, you know, we will we will we'll talk a bit about um, our our experience in in our hospital uh, managing you know, these kind of patients. Um, I think my, the previous colleague in you know, was talking about ECMO and how they manage you know, people that that go a bit off. 
Um, what we did in Ale because of uh, some of our colleagues were were being affected by the coronavirus, and we had you know like a mini crisis of human resources and whatever. And since you know we started having our our first patients, what we what we visioned in Ale was that we have to act quickly to try to uh, set up a multidisciplinary team to try to. Uh, minimizing you know, and try to be as as, be, as best as we could with the with the resources that we had in you know, LA for to to look after these patients. Um, and I think in you know, LA we we are now finalizing you know, gathering data because we are doing a we are doing a study of our experience. Um, the preliminary results in you know, LA of our experience are quite, my in our opinion, are quite uh, satisfactory. Because setting up this task force. That in, in which you know, like we involve um, all the multidisciplinary people that could be helping or contributing you know, like to to manage you know, like this um, with uh, with the leadership of our head of pneumology, Dr. De Luis, and I help out you know, like as much as I could as well you know, like in leading that, um, and obviously you know, like with the support of of our medical director, the head of pharmacy and supplies, lab, 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 the head of laboratory medicine. Uh, clinical governance, ICU, infection control officers, nurse managers, ED, pediatrics, imaging diagnostic, hematology, senior management. Uh, we set up a team in which you know, like we have clinical sessions, very effective, not in you know, like a long lasting, you know, like, uh, uh, useless you know, like meetings. You know, like it was you know, like very effective, uh, straight to the point, revising all our patients you know, like once in the morning at 9 o'clock and then you know, like in the afternoon later on, you know, and then. Been 24 hours as well, you know, like on, on call, you know, like for the emergency department and and setting setting up in you know, like pathways and, and and as I said, you know, like overall optimizing you know, like everything to produce you know like the best care that we could. Um, and the preliminary results are we managed you know, like to optimize the use of PPEs and, and the use of drugs. You know, like we had the ability to individualize treatment. I mean, we we could do selective medicine you know, like with these patients. We reduce. The number of inpatients needing to go down to ICU for non-invasive ventilation or other more invasive measures. Um, as I said, you know, like we managed to have an effective implementation of pathways between, especially in our emergency, the emergency department, emergency medicine, primary care, following our patients up. Because remember that we had you know, like people in, and we have discharged, and we discharged people, you know, like with COVID, you know, like to to their to their places because they were clinically well to be at home. But we have to follow them up, um, and the in-hospital care. So hopefully, you know, like we we are we are finalizing the gathering of the data. We are producing a paper. Um, just very proud to say that we anticipated, you know, like to what the WHO recommend in a document um, uh, released you know, on the 6th of April, recommending all of these kind of things. But we already you know, like had that implemented in our hospital in our organization. So I would open to any questions you know, that the audience you know, like want to want to hit, and, and I'm very happy you know, to stay as much as you guys you know, like want to answer you know, like all the questions. And thank you again thank you very much. much. Um, and stay safe. And, and as we said, you know, like you'll never walk alone. Thank you, Dr. Moya. We uh, are also uh, our hearts and thoughts also go to all the families. Uh, of uh, in Spain, of the people that uh, died or were fell ill to this uh, to this pandemic. So thank you for your update. Um, thank you. 4:21 p.m. And we are going to uh, keep going till 4:30 p.m. with some questions and answers. What I would do is I will actually ask specific people to unmute um, from the panel, and uh, I think I will take the first question uh, to Dr. Uh, to Captain Ignacio as well as to Mr. Kerner potentially. Regarding the uh, 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 hydrogen peroxide uh, 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 application on, and, uh, on uh, PPE, the question is a couple of questions on that. One is, um, is it a concern that it, this has not been tested against the SARS-CoV virus? Uh, you know, from the table that you showed, it, it seemed to, to have been tested against bacteria. Yeah. Then uh, yeah. I think the other, uh, and then the other question was whether there's a residue from the hydrogen peroxide. So if you want to please address those two questions. Um, I can only speak to, this is uh, Kath Ignacio, so yeah, that, that's true. I don't know uh, with regards to what was presented to the FDA when they reviewed the data, 
So I'm not sure if Battelle or ASP or, or the other manufacturers presented actual data uh, showing, showing efficacy against uh, SARS-CoV-2. So I, I don't know. I can, only, I can only say that that's what the existing peer review literature has. So, but, but yeah, I, that, that's a really good question. Um, all I can tell you, though, is that the FDA felt that the data that was presented to them by both Mattel and other four uh, uh, companies did seem to convince FDA that, that there was a show of efficacy as well as filtration performance uh, uh, remaining intact after a certain amount of uh, decontamination cycles. With regards to the concerns of hydrogen peroxide uh, residue, that's a question that I've uh, been asked. All I can speak to is on the critical care decon system. Uh, there is a two to three hour exposure time of the vaporous hydrogen peroxide to the N95 respirators in each of the decon chambers. And then there is a venting cycle. Uh, the, the hydrogen peroxide is, is vented out uh, my understanding through filters uh, for up to six to seven hours uh, later, or not later, uh, duration after the two to three hour decon cycle. Um, and then the Battelle team will actually conduct air monitoring in and around uh, each of the decon chambers to validate that it is uh, below detection level. So in terms of the respirators themselves, uh, my understanding is that uh, the Battelle uh, personnel checks each and every respirator, not only, not, I mean, they can't obviously see the hydrogen peroxide, but they, they're physically touching it with gloves and validating the, the uh, integrity of, the, of each of the respirators that they decontaminated. Whatever fails in that integrity or if it's soiled, uh, the Battelle team will, will, will dispose of in a biohazard bag. Um, I've not heard and we've spoken to Ohio State University hospital systems. We've talked with, um, with uh, uh, I forgot the name of the um, uh, uh, association that, that uh, is associated with Brigham Women's Hospital and Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, and they, n neither of those entities have indicated any concerns or issues with hydrogen peroxide residues being being detected or, or, or smelled by the healthcare personnel after they have um, put them on. Thank you, Captain Ignacio. Uh, Mr. Kerner, Couple questions for you. One is about uh, volunteer groups that are currently making masks on their own and they got run out of um, supplies. Can they get support from the federal government uh, to get cotton or elastic to help them in their um, volunteer work? The other question that uh, would be a potentially a uh, uh, question that you can answer uh, when you all looked at the reuse um, guidelines, what about, uh, you know, leaving the mask, uh, you know, unused and rotating through like three or four masks. Uh, did you all look at that? Uh, yes, thank you. And uh, just w one additional point to, um, to the prior question. The, the underlying technology for the uh, decontamination, the vaporizing, uh, high, high, vaporized hydrogen peroxide, is uh, the BioQuel um, device uh, that, that many may be familiar with for terminal cleaning of, of highly infectious rooms. It's a uh, EPA registered sterilant in that application, uh, which means you get a six log kill off of uh, spore forming bacteria, Geobacillus, and um, generally um, as a um, enveloped uh, RNA virus, uh, that, that's much easier to kill um, than a hard uh, spore forming uh, bacteria. Um, to your uh, question regarding the volunteer groups, uh, I think importantly it's uh, to, to understand that the masks that they're making um, are perfect for uh, general public use. They are perfect for uh, patient um, uh, 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 pa uh, source isolation for the patients. 
Uh, they may even substitute in a non-surgical environment for where you might wear a, um, a medical mask, uh, not an N95 respirator. Um, to that end, um, they are not considered respiratory protection. Um, they're intended to, to prevent droplets. Um, there is not a, although the, the federal government is supporting the distribution of, of face masks to the uh, uh, nursing home and the uh, skilled nursing um, facilities, because uh, they have different applications than in, in, uh, in uh, the hospital environment. Um, there's not any um, knowledge that I have federal support to uh, volunteer groups for um, for items and, and supplies to, to do that. Uh, although we do uh, appreciate and welcome um, any and all donations and volunteer efforts in this, this time of need. And I'm sure that all the providers uh, on the call would agree with that. Uh, in terms of the reuse construct, um, that's basic uh, uh, in the, the CDC guidance that has the um, five masks issued. Uh, you you uh, uh, maintain your own masks, you, get, uh, you wear them uh, one day, so it's extended use for, for each respirator on that day. Um, place it in the bag separate from the other four. Uh, and there's uh, a decent amount of information about the environmental persistence, and there is a, a, a natural decay um, in two or three days uh, of the virus in the environment. Um, and the bag really is just to, to keep it from getting otherwise contaminated while it's uh, going through a natural decay cycle. Just out of curiosity, uh, when the Battelle N95 mask comes back to you, does it come back to the same uh, healthcare worker? or does their own back? Yeah, it, that is an arrangement that has to be made. Uh, right now, it's it's uh, a batch that returns back to the healthcare facility itself, and then it's up to the healthcare facility to to then distribute. Um, so unless unless the healthcare facility makes an effort to identify each N95 respirator with the person's name written with a permanent ink marker on the N95. It comes back as a general batch, but having said that, uh, the the um, the folks that use it in Boston at uh, Mass General, one of the things they liked about uh, or the what increased acceptability was the ability for healthcare personnel to write their name and return have it returned back to them as opposed to a general batch. So, but that's something the healthcare facilities have to do. Thank you. Uh, I wonder whether uh, Dr. Wax or Kalilo have any uh, other questions that they monitored on the uh, other streaming lines. If not, I can ask another question. Uh, I have plenty of questions to go around. Now, um, what about the um, one of our participants asked, uh, Mr. Kerr, the numbers that you had mentioned about uh, the number of PPE being used per hospitalization, that was per patient, correct? The 375 uh, masks per hospitalization? Yeah, that, that's per patient, and that's an average over the various acuities of patient. Obviously, if they're in the ICU, that, that demand signal is, is higher. If they're very low acuity patient, don't require a lot of monitoring, it's lower. Very good, thank you. And then uh, regarding ethylene oxide, somebody, uh, one of you all mentioned uh, ethylene oxide. Do you think this is going to be uh, potential additional uh, method or? Still being looked at, or the well, the, the uh, there's some the the ethylene oxide, uh, not unlike the vaporous hydrogen peroxide, is a uh, a, a sterilant, uh, EPA a registered sterilant and accepted by the FDA as sterilant, as we all know for various equipment. The concern um, that the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health and the OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, have is that it's also a um, a, uh, a carcinogen. And there is, a, unlike with the vaporous hydrogen peroxide, there is a potential for um, some sort of residual in the matrix of the respirator itself. Yes, and we are, you know, our community of toxicologists is well aware of these uh, issues with ethylene oxide. Thank you for a great answer. I think Dr. Wax is now off mute and can maybe uh, field some of his questions that he, he gathered. Yeah, uh, hello. Um, so question about how long does the uh, virus uh, on an on a N95, uh, how long would it uh, be viable, you know, prior to decontamination? 
So I, th I think that that gets to the the prior question about the um, the uh, reuse protocol with the the rotating out five. Um, I think the, the the majority of the environmental persistence on surfaces um, sh shows uh, around two or three days um, for infectivity uh, of the virus. After that, it, it's kind of deactivated naturally, um, and of course that's, that that period is shortened when it's when exposed to higher temperatures and, um, and uh, sunlight. Okay, uh, another question, this uh, maybe for Dr. Kapil. Uh, are there any extra PPE Dr. needed? Kapil, uh, for, well, Dr. Kapil had to uh, step I think away she, to give a patient. Oh, did she, she step away? Patient. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Well, we won't ask that question yet. <laughs> um, I have a question. Um, one of our uh, two of our participants asked about the uh, the uh, the uh, the way it looks down the horizon. You know, are, are these uh, PPE uh, supply issues going to be resolved, or is it something we need to live with for the time being? And after the pandemic uh, subsides, uh, is this type of reuse going to be a standard procedure, or are we going to go back to uh, the non the, the old the old uh, you know standard operating procedures? Yeah, this is uh, Captain Ignacio. Um, so part of my other job, not only supporting the preservation working group, but is also to be the liaison to the supply chain task force within FEMA. And it is going, the supply issue is going to be around a while, particularly if we get a resurgence uh, requiring additional PPE again, like we saw with this uh, January, February, March, April uh, wave. And a lot of it has to do with importation times from overseas, particularly uh, as we transition from the air bridge that most folks heard about to uh, a maritime bridge, which is now 30 days import from Asia or uh, other locations, Europe. Um, so that's one, as well as the raw materials required to, de to develop uh, disposables. The effort right now that we have asked the supply chain uh, community is to start to pivot towards more of the non-disposable kinds of respirators like the elastomeric half base, uh, increased usage of the powered air purifying respirators, which many healthcare facilities already use. Uh, we understand from a healthcare resilience perspective that it's not preferred compared relative to a, a disposable respirator, but, but the fact is, is that Powered air purifying respirators, half face uh, elastomerics are non disposable with the exception of the filter, but the filter could probably get reused over a few shifts depending upon the specific uh, standing operating procedures established. So, so from a, from a reuse perspective, uh, you could literally replace thousands of N95 respirators with one elastomeric when you start to count the, the number of N95s that you use, like, like John uh, mentioned, uh, to, to, uh, in, in, in a given healthcare facility over a period of time. So, so uh, that's kind of where we're looking at with regards to trying to stem the demand for N95 respirators. Thank you, Captain Ignacio. I uh, want to turn it over to Dr. Calillo. I think she has a couple of questions that she uh, monitored. Yes, thanks so much. Actually, this is my own question uh, in full disclosure for Dr. Moya. Um, thanks so much for detailing the experience in Malaga. Um, I would like to ask you, you alluded to the general acceptance of the lockdown procedures in Spain, um, but, you know, obviously these are hard restrictions to accept, and I'm wondering if you could comment first on if there was measurable resistance to lockdown measures and how that was approached. And then as a bit of a corollary, um, you know, if uh, there was a lot of issues with kind of workforce absenteeism in healthcare workers, either in response to that or just in response to the surge in Spain. Well, Diane, um, 
the first question is I think in you know, the numbers of I could see because you know in the in the strict in the strict lockdown that we had you know like for around uh, two weeks and then we had you know like a less strict lockdown for another two weeks so it's been two three weeks so it's been 45 days I think of all and in the in the in the period in which you know, like all the essential work was allowed and the movement was restricted to between everything uh, between the whole country and only in you know, like people that consider to be essential you know they like have to go to work like police uh, even the army the army can kind of work in the streets um, and police you know, like was policing the number of uh, I could I could tell you that I went to work every day and I couldn't see anyone anyone and and I thought you know it's amazing you know like completely you know, like empty cities and you could see you know like pictures of Madrid or Barcelona you know, which are probably you know like they, well, they are the biggest cities in Spain and the busiest uh, completely empty and people really really being resilient and, and being at home I mean surprisingly there were little detentions there were little you know like breach of, of the rules it was, it was um, Amazing, you know, like um, I think you know that's that's why I, I I told you before that I was really proud, you know, like how all 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 the people you know hate in the country, um, and how we measure that is because as I said to you, you know, there were hardly any detentions, there were hardly you know like any any people in the street. I mean, and you could see that, um, and and that was the uh, and also you know like the the, the fruit you know like we could collect you know like the uh, the fruit after after we invest and we see it because because that was a, an effective measure you know to stop the cases you know like coming in and in and to stop the infection and the spread. I think probably that's that's the best measure you know that, that we started managing you know, to flatten the curve. Um, and after that you know like there were some work you know that like was allowed um, and there was only you know like kind of uh, building work. Uh, the, uh, big building sites and whatever, and, and now we are in phase zero, which is the preparation for um, uh, relaxed escalation. And and the and the the law on how we the government you know, maintain this was they have to issue what we call in Spain the emergency state, and obviously you know, like the, that empowered the government um, to 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 kind of you know, like impose those, those those rules you know like for for the for the, for the whole country, um, I have to say that Spain is a, probably a little replication of the United States because I don't know if you know that Spain is divided in seventeen states and every state you know like deals you know like with their own uh, political um, um, territory and they even they have the autonomy you know like to rule in you know, their health system. And obviously, that's probably you not know, like been one of our problems at the beginning, our lack of preparation, because there was a bit of this coordination you know, like between the central government, how the government was empowered, empowered to do uh, the supplies. You know, there like was a problem of the PPEs and testing and whatever, because some 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 things you know, like were transferred to this state. So there was a bit of mishaps, you know, like of not knowing, you know, like it was our local Andalusia government, you know, like, like replicating, you know, like for example, California, you know, like trying to go and, 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 and get the supplies or it was in you know, our central government. So that's the coordination probably, you know, like contributed to the fact, you know, that, that we have such terrible numbers, you know, like at the beginning. Um, and the second question, just can you remind me, you know, like what, what, you, what you were interested in? Into, Yes, I was just wondering about um, worker and uh, absenteeism, either in the healthcare sector or other essential workers. Was that a significant issue? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we were essential workers, and and as I said, you know, we had free of movement. You know, we see now even even you know, like between jurisdictions, you know, like because they, there was a call from Madrid at some stage from. Everybody, because some regions, you know, as you can imagine, some regions, you know, like, um, were affected more, and we had our outbreaks, you know, like kind of, of epicenters, like Madrid and Catalonia, especially. And even, you know, like in our health group and, and within, you know, like public, the public health system as well, they were Madrid and Barcelona, some states, you know, they were asking, you know, like for human resources in other areas. So we had, we had free of movement somehow. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Dr. Moya. Thank you, Dr. Kalilo, for uh, for um, 
these questions. I think it's time to wrap it up. I'm going to turn it over to my uh, partner, Dr. Paul Wax, to uh, wrap this up today. Okay. Well, I'd like to, again, uh, thank uh, all the speakers um, and, the, and the panelists for really a, a, an amazing uh, discussion today on a, on a whole host of uh, topics. Uh, you know, pardon us going late today, but uh, we thought it was uh, essential to try to, you know, continue to push out these communications uh, as rapidly as possible. Um, as mentioned at the outset, the webinar is recorded and will appear on the ACMT website uh, uh, on Friday. Uh, there are other resources on the website. If you have questions, uh, you can uh, contact us at info at acmt.net. Uh, next week, uh, we plan another webinar uh, at the same time. We'll be moving into a somewhat different uh, perspective next week when we talk about the psychological re resilience during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, Dr. Uh, Caslow, our speaker, is the past president of the American Psychological Association, and it should indeed be a, an excellent uh, uh, and very timely uh, presentation about um, what um, literally the entire globe is going through uh, as we uh, uh, experience uh, this pandemic. So that will be next Wednesday on May 13th at 3 p.m. We'll, we will also have uh, several uh, speakers uh, from the front lines again. Uh, thank you very much and have a good day.